I'm here to talk about programming your data, uh, specifically around hash maps and trees. Um, hash maps are a pretty common thing that you'll see in JavaScript, but uh, pretty frequently they're underutilized and not appreciated for uh, all the different things that they can do and how well they do them. And then also with trees, I think it's a pretty common thing that people don't know how to use them in kind of real world situations. A lot of times you see them in, say, maths, and we probably don't build a lot of software around maths. <coughs> uh, so hash maps themselves are very versatile, and you can do loads of different things with them. Um, if you're not familiar with the term hash map, in the JavaScript world, we call them uh, plain objects. Uh, they can be, <laughs> they can be uh, anything from a basic primitive key value pair to something much more sophisticated. Um, in other languages, you can do like list links and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those because that's too complicated. Uh, just the basic uses of uh, hash maps to do things in a different way that is hopefully better than how you may have done them without thinking about it. So before we get into the nitty gritties of it, uh, some often overlooked details with hash maps are they are an extremely efficient uh, storage mechanism. Uh, they take up only exactly as much space as they need uh, versus say, an array in JavaScript, uh, when you create a new array in JavaScript under the hood, it actually allocates a significant amount of space in case the array needs to grow. The reason for that is because when an array uh, needs to grow, uh, it needs to stay together. And uh, under the hood in memory, that giant thing has to get moved around into where there is space for it. But with a hash map, that is not the case. Another thing about hash maps is when you're trying to retrieve a value from it, the path that you have, say foo.bar, is, is a reference to an exact location in memory. So the lookup is virtually free. Uh, whereas if you're trying to find something in some other storage mechanism, that can be very expensive. With hash maps, it kind of allows the computer to play a game of Tetris uh, in that it takes the individual pieces of the hash map and fits them in the best place that it can uh, so that it can create a perfect block. Um, so that allows it to fit the small pieces where it has small space, and then large pieces where it has large space. So an example of where you might um, use a hash map instead of some other um, data structure where you may not have thought about it uh, is this. And this comes from a real world project that I worked on a few years ago that I'll go into in a minute. So given a set of coordinates uh, that represent data points, set up the data uh, for quickly checking whether the data point exists. So most common thing that people will jump to is an array of arrays, um, where inside of the inner arrays you have x and y coordinates. If you want to find uh, whether the point exists, uh, that can potentially be extremely expensive, especially if your data is very, very large. So in the case that I was doing this for, I used to Mm, about six years ago, worked for a company that made software that runs the internet. So it dealt with uh, IP address allocation and DNS um, and that sort of thing. So the amount of data that it would be working with at any given time was massive. So you cannot do something uh, as heinously inefficient as this. Um, it, it would just immediately fall over. The reason for that is here. Because if you're trying to find whether something exists, if it happens to be the last item in your array, 
you have to look through everything before you get there. Or if it, in fact, does not exist, you have to verify all of your items are not what you're looking for. As an alternative, you can use a hash map. So here, I have concatenated the x and y coordinates. Um, so you would never have an xy collision, so you don't really need to worry about that. And the concatenation is uh, a very simple operation. Uh, then I have set the value of it to true. Uh, this enables it to uh, pass or fail a, a truthy, falsy test. And as a bonus point, uh, using the Boolean true means that the value itself actually only takes up one bit of space. So it is both um, storage efficient and runtime efficient. Um, <clears throat> and then when you go to look up whether something is present, you only ever have to do it once. You don't ever have to check anything that is not relevant to what you're looking for, uh, contrary to the <coughs> previous example where you have to check everything. Um, some other use cases where you might see this is, I think you all are probably familiar with React. You may have heard of it. Under the hood, when you create your components and it gets run through React, React creates a hash map of all of your components. And the keys of that hash map are symbols of your components' names. Um, symbols you may not be terribly familiar with because they were kind of like a new thing and you're like, oh, cool, I don't know how to use this. Uh, symbols, the main reason that they do that is because symbols are always unique, so you don't have to worry about collisions. JavaScript in a plain objects has nothing to help you with collisions, so you would have to manage that yourself. The collision being where you have the same name of a key. Um, in other languages, there are things to deal with it, but here you would probably just stomp the previous value. Um, so React doing it this way, it can very quickly look up your component and piece all of the bits together. So another uh, example, if you wanted to do something a little bit more fun, uh, you could create a simple substitution cipher. Um, a substitution cipher is just a simple swap. So A becomes C, B becomes Z. So what you would do here is you would just create a very simple hash map uh, of what you want to go to and from, and then you very simply loop over your uh, input, swapping things as you go. Unfortunately, in JavaScript, strings are immutable. Uh, so in this example, I've used an array. Um, bonus point on data structures. Uh, earlier, I said uh, when you create an array under the hood, uh, JavaScript will be creating a massive data store that is much larger than you need. Um, if you happen to know the exact size of the array that you want, you can pass it to the constructor, and then it will create the array exactly sized as you want. Since we know that the length of the output will equal the length of the input, you can just use that directly. And then as you loop through, you can use the indexes of one as the index of the other, and then just uh, switch as you go. Uh, and then you get Hello World. <laughs> so uh, with trees, as I mentioned, a lot of times the examples that you will get in academia are either very vague or are completely unrelatable to anything that anyone would ever actually do. So the point that I want to get through here is how you could actually use a tree to do something rather than find some probability. Um, if you're not familiar with a tree, uh, it is more or less just a relationship uh, of parent-child. The child, 
child is generally somehow derived from the parent or in some way related. Uh, if you're doing maths and you're doing like an ordered tree or something, the children will be smaller than the parent, something like that. In terms of structure, if you're not familiar, there's generally two different kinds, binary, non-binary. Binary are the boring ones. Binary, uh, non-binary are the interesting ones. <laughs> so it has a couple main things. So the nodes that are above, those are called parents. The nodes that are below are called children uh, or a child. Uh, if the node is the topmost one, it's called a root. And if the children have no children of their own, they're called leaves. Uh, the lines that connect them are just references or pointers. Um, I'm going to be talking about the non-binary non trees because they're more versatile and, yes, more interesting. So the first time uh, you encountered a tree, you were actually probably very young and you probably had no idea <laughs> what, uh, what a tree, a data tree was at all. A family tree. Uh, so a family tree literally has uh, parents and literally has children. Uh, these children then go on to have maybe their own children and they all have some kind of relationship amongst each other. Another example of a tree that you may not have really thought about is the dom. Surprisingly, the dom tree is in fact a tree. <laughs> the, uh, each of the nodes in your dom tree, uh, they have children. Those are very conveniently called children. The top node of your tree is in fact a, uh, a root and it is also called a root. Um, one thing that is a bit important to note about trees is there can only be one way to reach a node. Uh, and in fact, with a DOM tree, there is only one way to get here. Um, this is also a bit helpful when you're trying to use pointers to get through to your, um, say, a leaf, uh, because you can provide potentially an exact path to get there, and then it will do the tree traversal in that way. If you don't, then it has to do a whole lot of guessing which is not good. So within trees, there's a few different subcategories. Um, one of those other kinds of trees is called a tree. <laughs> uh, it's also pronounced tri, just to differentiate it from tree. Uh, but it should really be pronounced tree because it comes from the word retrieval, hence T-R-I-E. Uh, these are generally used in language. Uh, so my, uh, what I first studied at university was linguistics. So in linguistics, we use trees uh, to figure out things about words. So say you have a problem uh, that you all have probably seen before. You're typing on your mobile and it suggests words that you're probably going to be typing. And then you just tap on that word and it fills it in for you. Under the hood, it is probably, I haven't seen iOS's source code because no one has. Um, <laughs> uh, under the hood, it is probably first starting out with a uh, try to figure out what word you might be typing. Uh, then subsequently, it would run through those dictionaries and say, okay, you're looking for a noun, and then through some other kind of dictionary and say, okay, you use these things. Um, so this tree uh, would, uh, look like this, roughly. <clears throat> so you have inputted T-H-E. So then it needs to go through and find all of the possibilities. So I've narrowed it down to just these because otherwise it would be more than the, the wall has. Um, so with this try, uh, the special bit about it is that the root node is empty because all it is doing is providing the ability to get to pointers for the start of your word. So you would potentially have 
a massive number of uh, first, um, first level nodes. Uh, well, not massive, uh, the alphabet. <laughs> then it's going to go down uh, the paths of the try and match the input. Uh, one of the main reasons that they do this is because uh, following these pointers with the input that you've given uh, is, can be done in constant time, meaning that it's extremely efficient uh, for running them. So when you put in T H E, it will never hit any of the red nodes. It will only ever get to the green ones. Then there will be a flag on E itself uh, that says this is a possible terminus. The word could end here. Then there would be children uh, that contain other possible matches if it were to go on. So you end up with the thermometer, yada, yada, yada. yada. Um, <clears throat> How do I do this? Oh, yeah. Uh, end flag. Jump the gun a little bit. OK, so if you want to know more about the crazy, absolutely batch of crazy, uh, uses that you can do for, uh, say, hash maps and trees, there is a book uh, written by a high level Googler called Cracking the Coding Interview. Uh, if you have not read it uh, and you go to read it, it's OK. You might feel a little bit stupid. Uh, <laughs> you'll probably read through it a bit and then need to do a whole bunch of research and then go back and read through it again. And you're like, ah, I got it. Uh, you're not alone. <laughs> uh, there are loads of different use cases in that one. I recommend it. Uh, if you want to know more about trees, specifically, like programmatically dealing with the trees. Uh, if you're not familiar with Khan Academy, uh, it is a project that was put on or is still run by Dartmouth University, one of the Ivy Leagues in the States. Uh, they have quite a few different uh, tutorials on it. They show you how trees work and how you can interact with them, uh, how you can find things in them. And that's it. Thanks.